Okay, there we go. Beautiful. All right, so we have the um, original plate, right? This is the original uh, print, original mm -hmm. plate that's also found in the first folio. This is, as you can see, is the second impression, but Martin Darshart's um, image of Shakespeare. Nobody knows, nobody really knew what Shakespeare looks like. We think we knew what Shakespeare looks like because right. we have these images. And the Cobb portrait shows him with hair. Right, exactly. But this looks pretty similar to the Cobb portrait, Yeah, uh, which is pretty remarkable in many ways. So, you know, Shakespeare looks kind of like this. Yeah. There's uh, Ben Jonson's famous to the reader uh, entry. And what's really significant about this one is that the plays are the same as in the first folio. In the second folio, let's see if I can find it. Once again, this is the second folio, second. And, and the year is what, Max? This is 18, uh, 1632? 1632. Right, and, the, and the first is 1623, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, I think, yeah, this is it. Unworthy Master Shakespeare and his poems is the very first printing, very first publication of anything by John Milton. This is John Milton's wow. first appearance in the world. It happens to be in the second folio of Shakespeare. Oh, my was, word. When he was still a college student. Wow. Amazing. It is, isn't it? <laughs> it certainly is. Yeah. And he's got his own complete works now published, too. I think uh, with the Riverside, the Oxford. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Another, th another thing I love about this, and you know, nobody else really points out very much, are the fact this is among the most collectible books you know in the world. Right? Yeah. Um, first folio is far more collectible, but second folio is just, you know is worth something. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. But you know this is early seven, seven, early seventeenth century British bookmaking, early seventeenth century British printing. Right? Yeah. Look at this. You know, this is a lousy topography. <laughs> yeah. It just I mean there it's awful. I mean, look at the spacing. Yeah, the here. spacing is. Look messy. at the S's are all different, and that's true. You know, if you run out of a a W, well, you just you know over here, like, you just put a couple of V's together. That's probably good <laughs> enough, right? You know, and you know the printing is his vit, his vit, yes, his vivid, his vivid, his vivid, <laughs> superf. Of course, that's the long S, but that long S appears very you know, in a standard way through all 17th century books right up, to the, right up to the end of the 18th century. But my students don't realize this, so they look at it and they go, well, what does the surpef mean? Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, maybe <laughs> we can... Breath. Can we find the, um, uh, the Lark scene in Romeo and Juliet in here? Well, uh, that is something you'll have to do, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to try, certainly. But, you know, as I was going through, this is the first time I ever saw this. This is kind of cool. I was, I, you know, I was leafing through that. It's looking kind of beautiful. So, yeah. It is beautiful. It may be, you know, a wonky book, but it has some beautiful cuts in it. But look at the, the ink impression is terrible. Paper is awful. Yeah. Um, this is handmade paper, but it's really thin. It's got impurities of all sorts. Mm. And the printing's uneven. Yeah. It's a silly book. Still, though, there's, no, there's nothing like that... Uh, the, the hand of paper made in that century. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. And any century before the 19th century. Mm. All right, so what are we looking for? We're looking for Romeo and Juliet. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou? Things have fallen out so unluckily. Wilt thou be gone? Here it is, right here. Okay, you're on. Well, this is a very exciting moment. It is Shakespeare's birthday today and death day, I might add, April 23rd. 2012, his 448th birthday, and I am here at the Goldemeyer Library at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, uh, UWM, and uh, we're here in the special collection, um, and I've just seen the most amazing books, the Variorum, um, assembled of Shakespeare's works that's here in the special collection, and most importantly, the second folio uh, of William Shakespeare's complete works, published in 1632. This is an unbelievably special book. Maybe not as special as was previously stated in our first, uh, in, in um, my interview with Max here, who's gratefully and, um, and generously, well, not gratefully, I'm the grateful one, uh, <laughs> taping um, this reading of Roman and Juliet on Shakespeare's birthday, but it is still very, very special. And as you'll see in the other video, we did flip through some of these pages, and Max showed some of these uh, really unique markings on the book. We are going to read one of my favorite scenes in all of Shakespeare. It's the scene I have coming up next, and I've saved it for today. It is the Lark scene from Romeo and Juliet. I can think of no other way to celebrate Shakespeare's birthday than by having my trusty companion, Yorick, here and reading this fabulous scene directly from the second folio. So if you'll pardon me, I'm going to go to church for a moment, 
and uh, hopefully this is at least half as fun for you as it is for me. Here we are, in Act 3. What scene it is, this book doesn't tell me, but I believe the Lark scene is Act 3, Scene 5, although I will double-check with you anon. Enter Romeo, Romeo and Juliet aloft. Wilt thou be gone? It was the nightingale and not the lark that pierced the fearful hollow of thine ear. Nightly she sings on yon pomegranate tree. Believe me, love, it was the nightingale. It was the lark, the herald of the morn. No nightingale. Look, love, what envious streaks do lace the fevering clouds in yonder east. Night's candles are burnt out, and jocund day stands tiptoe on the misty mountain tops. I must be gone and live, or stay and die. Yond light is not daylight, I know it, I. It is some meteor that the sun exhales to be to thee this night a torchbearer, and light thee on thy way to Mantua. Therefore stay, if thou needst not be gone. Let me be tame, let me be put to death, I am content. So thou wilt have it so. I'll say yon gray is not the morning's eye. Tis but the pale ref reflex of Cynthia's brow. Nor that is not the lark, whose notes do beat the vaunty heaven for so high above our heads. I have more care to stay than will to go. Come death and welcome, Juliet wills it so. How is my soul? Let's talk, it is not day. It is, it is, high hence, be gone, away. It is the lark that sings so out of tune, straining harsh discords and unpleasing sharps. Some say the lark makes sweet division. This doth not so, so she divideth us. Some say the lark and loathed toad change eyes. Oh, now I would they had changed voices too, since arm from arm that voice doth us affray. Hunting thee hence, with hunts up to the day. O oh, now be gone, more light and light it grows, More light and light, more dark and dark our woes. Enter Madam and Nurse. Madam, Nurse, your lady mother is coming to your chamber, The day is broke, be wary, look about. Then window let day in, and let life out. Farewell, farewell, one kiss and I'll descend. Art thou gone so? Love, Lord, ah, husband, friend, I must hear from thee every day into the hour, for in a minute there are many days. Oh, by this count I shall be much in years, ere I again behold my Romeo. Farewell. I will admit no opportunity that may convey my greetings, love, to thee. Or thinkest thou we shall ever meet again? I doubt it not. And all these woes shall serve for sweet discourses in our time to come. O oh God, I have an ill-divining soul. Methinks I see thee now. Thou art so low as one dead in the bottom of a tomb. Either my eyesight fails, or thou lookst pale. And trust me, love, in my eyes so do you. Dry sorrow drinks our blood. Adieu, adieu. Exits. O oh, fortune. Fortune, all men call thee fickle. If thou art fickle, what dost thou with him that is renowned for faith? Be fickle, fortune. For then I hope thou wilt not keep him long, but send him back. Enter mother. Ho, oh, daughter, are you up? Who is that calls? Is it my lady mother? Is she not down so late or up so early? What unaccustomed cause procures her hither? Well, how now, Juliet? Uh, madam, I am not well. Evermore weeping for your cousin's death. What wilt thou wash him from his grave with tears? And if thou couldst, thou couldst not make him live. Therefore have done. Some grief shows much of love, but much of grief shows still some want of wit. Yet let me weep for such a feeling loss. So shall you feel the loss, but not the friend which you weep for. Feeling so the for the loss, I cannot choose but ever weep the friend. Well, girl, thou weepest not so much for his death as that the villain lives which slaughtered him. What villain, madam? That same villain, Romeo. The villain and he be many miles asunder. God pardon him, I do with all my heart, and yet no man like he doth grieve my heart. 
That is because the traitor lives. Aye, madam, from the reach of these my hands. Would none but I might venge my cousin's death? We will have vengeance for it, fear thou not. And then weep no more. I'll send to one in Mantua, where that same banished runagate doth live, shall give him such an unaccustomed dram that he shall soon keep Tybalt company. And then I hope thou wilt be satisfied. Indeed, I never shall be satisfied with Romeo till I behold him dead. Is my poor heart. So for a kinsman vexed. Madam, if you could find out but a man to bear a poison, I would temper it, that Romeo should, upon receipt thereof, soon sleep in quiet. Oh, my heart abhors to hear him named, and cannot come to him, to wreak the love I bore my cousin Tybalt upon his body that hath slaughtered him. Find thou the means, and I'll find such a man. But now I'll tell thee joyful tidings, girl. A joy becomes well in such a needy time. What are they, I beseech your ladyship? Well, well, thou hast a careful father, child, one who put thee, one who to put thee from thy heaviness hath sorted out a sudden day of joy that thou expects not, nor I look not for. Madam, in happy time, what day is this? Mary, my child, early next Thursday morn. The gallant, young, and noble gentleman, the county Paris at St. Peter's Church, shall happily make thee a joyful bride. Not by St. Peter's Church, and Peter too. He shall not make me there a joyful bride. I wonder at this... I wonder at this haste that I must wed ere he that should be husband comes to woo. I pray you tell my lord and father, madam, I will not marry yet, and when I do, I swear it shall be Romeo, whom you know I hate, rather than Paris. These are news indeed. Here comes your father. Tell him so yourself, and see how he will take it at your hands. There.